Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this Reformation Sunday <clears throat> I have, uh, is a little different. And I have selected, or I'd like to think the Holy Spirit chose me, uh, led me to choose uh, Acts 2, 42 to 47. And it might be good to tell you right now why. Because I think in this little passage, it tells us when you're cleaning out your room, the church, this is what you don't throw away. This is what stays. They, who's they? The believers, you, me. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread, what's that mean? And to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 45. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he has need, had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Every day. They go to church every day. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. What's that mean? Does that mean communion? Could be, but it means sharing a meal. Sharing a meal. You guys go to each other's homes? All right. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And our theme is reform is the rage. And it really is. If you listen to the news at all in this uh, campaign season. Can you believe we have 13 more months of this? I heard this week Canada had an election and their campaign season was 11 weeks short. Let's all move to Canada. <laughs> okay. But seriously, the word reform is used a lot in the United States and when uh, politics is being talked, reform this, reform that. I wrote a kind of little list. Immigration reform, that's been around for a while. Judicial reform. I read a little piece about how in 2013, the state of Illinois, which has 16,000 juveniles going through courts, each year and many of them ending up in prison. A juvenile is anyone under 17. Instituted juvenile judicial reform. That if you get in trouble with the law, if you're under 18, you don't go through an adult court. So you don't have a record. These kids don't have a record and they have reform program, rehabilitation programs. That's reform. Prison reform, mental health reform, financial reform. Here's one of my own I hope nobody works for the post office, but I think the United States Postal Service could do a little reform. I didn't say that, did I? Tax reform and so forth. Reform is keeping the good uh, and throwing out the bad, the things that get in the way. We'll always need banks. We'll always need government. We'll probably always need prisons and courts and stuff like that. But sometimes it kind of deteriorates, so you need to have a reform. So there's a lot of that, maybe on a, on a more um, familiar basis is uh, you look at your house and you say, I'm, I'm gonna change the furniture, right? So she announces to you, Sid, like today, or this week, we're gonna change the furniture. I want this over there and that over there and this couch is old, we're gonna go buy a new one. That would be reform. And Sid loves reforms like that, right? But you get the idea, you, you don't, you don't throw away the house. You just rearrange it. And you showcase what's important. And you keep what's usable. And if something is old and out of date, you would consider getting something, something new. Here's something important to remember, that reform is not conform. You don't conform, but you reform it. You refresh it. Reform is not transform. There's a lot of chalk in church today and about discipleship that we need to be transformed. I think, I think that's true, but um, you don't need to be a t 
a new person. You are who you are, but there might be some reforms that you need in your walk in life. You know, be kinder to people, be more forgiving, be more patient with your spouse, uh, be gentler with your children. You're not going to get new children, but the ones you have, you're going to reform and relate to them differently. Reform is not also revolt or rebellion, but it's keeping the good and throwing away the bad. Luther's principle, he was a reformer of the church, was not to throw out the church and start a new one. There's a lot of misconceptions about that. But God used his servant Luther to reform the church. And Luther's guiding principle was anything that keeps you close to Christ, you keep. If a clergyman wearing a robe keeps you close to Christ, and I'd like to think it does, I don't wear this robe um, <clears throat> to set myself off. I wear a white robe to cover my sinfulness. You don't see Gary the sinner, you see Gary the servant of God. We light candles because we think of John chapter mm, 1, I think, or in John, Jesus is the light of the world. We have stained glass windows because the same principle, because the light coming through these beautiful colored windows or non-colored windows have windows, reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. We have music. It might be time to do some contemporary music, but we have music because the joy of the resurrection and of our hope of going to heaven because of Christ's perfect life, his death on the cross, and his glorious resurrection gives us joy. And we want to express our joy to God, give him praises for forgiveness of sins and the hope that we have in us. So reform is the rage. Let me just read you one little story before we get to the text. This is reform about mental health. It's called Anne's story. Just to just to embellish this a little bit, to give you the idea, you keep what's good, but you throw out what's bad. Hello, my name is Ann Foley, and this is my story in the mental health services. I first was referred to the mental health services in Wexford, wherever that is, 16 years ago, was diagnosed with depression and was hospitalized for three months. I was on a lot of medications that were to define my life for the next 10 years. Five years ago, I was hospitalized again for a short time, but this time things were different, reformed. I was referred to the local mental health center, Maryville, in my town. Here I was looked at as a whole person, not just my illness. Oh, that's different, a whole person. With the help of the team, I was able to reduce my medication I was lucky in that, in that, at this time, new treatment plans were being devised to treat people with mental health issues. It says new, not necessarily all medication, but something new, reform, which included a care plan where the whole team treating your GP, I assume that's general practitioner, and yourself were involved in making up your treatment plan. I now have a key worker, Helen, who oversees my case and is my first point of contact and the person I see most often. So reading between the lines, I see Anne has a different kind of therapy. When things go bad and she sinks into depression or has an anxiety attack or whatever it is, instead of going to the medicine cabinet, she calls up Helen. The team in Maryville became my lifeline and gave me the belief that I could lead a normal life and still recover from depression. The first 10 years after my original diagnosis went by in a haze where I was locked away inside of myself, living but not living fully. Maryville and the town and Helen changed all that along with a lot, a lot of work on my part. I started to live again. I got back into education, started to set goals and achieve them, started enjoying my life, my children, my new grandchildren, my family, my brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, and my friends. My key worker makes time for me if I need her. She would often recognize I was unwell before I would. I've learned how to deal with my thoughts and how to change negative thinking and thoughts into positive ones. You may ask, how do I know that Maryville and the team there have helped me in this positive way? The answer is when I heard my granddaughter ask my daughter a couple years ago, why is Nanny, 
able to play with me now where she could not before. And my daughter told her because Nanny was sick and when you were born and when you were younger, but now she is better so she's able to play with you. And when my sister tells everyone that I am her hero, <clears throat> excuse me, because for 10 years I was lost to my family but have found my way back. I'm exhilarated. And when my friends know I am someone they can call if they need a shoulder to lean on, I know I'm getting better. And when people like mental health reform or Shine ask me to give interviews or volunteer to spread awareness, I do that. I now advocate for reform in the mental health services to continue. I'm a spokesperson for those kind of changes. This is Reformation Sunday. We celebrate an event which happened, by the way, in two years, 2017, will be the 500th anniversary of the Reformation of the Church, where Luther said he saw the abuses of the church and he says, these indulgences are getting in the way of people seeing Jesus. Hmm. The fact that Bibles are locked away from the lay people and in a language they can't ra read gets in the way of Jesus. So he threw out what got in the way of Jesus and he kept what keeps you closer to Jesus. Really important. Since we're talking, since we're celebrating that, observing once again that uh, event, important because the church is important to you, we enjoy those reforms. Hmm. We might think, uh, 500 years later, is there anything, is there any furniture in the church? And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about spiritual furniture that needs to be given to goodwill hmm. and rearranged. Hmm. Is the Bible still on the altar? Or do we just kind of give it lip service? Is the spirit at work in our hearts? where we are close to one another. Speaking of hearts and attitudes, do we have an inclusive attitude about people? No surprise to me that El Centro has a heavily Hispanic population. Probably the, could be the highest in the country. I gotta slip this in. I never thought I could, would do ministry in a place hotter than Phoenix. <laughs> Not it's hotter here than in Phoenix. How can that be? But that's, uh, <clears throat> that's just a little footnote. So if reform is the rage, maybe we should get on with that. And I think God gives us <clears throat> a template for that reform. So <clears throat> let's get to the heart of the sermon I'll keep it short. We'll wind it up here shortly. But once again, let's just look at the text. These are the things that are important. The believers devoted themselves. First of all, you need to devote yourself. Discipleship is a full-time job. It is a major commitment. It's even stronger than marriage. I say that because, you know, marriage this day is a poor metaphor for loyalty. So many people bail out. It's like company loyalty, only it's more. So the first thing is we are loyal to the Lord. And the action then, the way of keeping this, is you're devoted to the apostles' teaching. Who are the apostles? Peter, James, John, all those guys who walked with Jesus and who saw the risen Jesus. And this includes St. Paul. Okay, so we're loyal to what Peter taught and what John saw. And the way St. Paul applies the gospel, it's called the New Testament. We read it and we ingest it. And I heard a sermon a couple weeks ago. Here's just a little example. When St. Paul says Christians don't take each other to court, he's serious. And he's saying, Gary, he's saying, you, if, even if a, a fellow believer hurts you so bad and is, uh, does something unjust to you, you don't take him to court because you're family. Okay, so we devote ourselves to those kinds of teaching. And the big teaching is not court or not court. The big teaching is your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, for your sins. And all your sins are forgiven. And his glorious resurrection <clears throat> manifests that his payment is sufficient. 
you don't need to worry about your sins. They are taken care of. That is not a license, as St. Paul says, to go out and sin some more. No, you try to walk closer with the Spirit. But if you slip, you say your little prayer at night on the pillow of your bed, and you go, as Luther says, quickly to sleep, because grace covers it all. We devote ourselves to that. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said in John chapter 8, and the truth shall set you free. Your conscience is free. You're okay. I mean, you're not okay because you do some lousy things, and so do I, but God is so gracious. He cleans them like a dry erase board. Have you seen those? Those dry erase boards and those non-permanent markers. You write on there, and it just erases, and it goes away. It goes away. Grace. So we live free and grateful. So, okay, that's one. To the breaking of the bread. Oh, excuse me, there's one. And to fellowship. What's fellowship? It's kind of now, but it's when you drink your coffee after the service. Right? All right. And you see somebody at uh, Walmart. You have a Walmart here? I'm sure you do. Probably three of them, huh? Okay, you see somebody at Walmart. You don't ignore your brother and sister of Christ. You say, hi, Helen. Good to see you. You don't have to have a 30-minute conversation. Unless you feel like it and you have time. But you acknowledge each other. That's fellowship. <clears throat> to the breaking of bread. You got that wrong. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is the assurance of forgiveness. Hmm? It's like us husbands. When we do something, we do something snooty to... Don't look at me that way. <laughs> you do something snooty to your wives, you say you're sorry. And she goes, that's okay, I forgive you. You assure her that you're sorry, you buy her some flowers. <laughs> Communion is the flowers that God gives to you to assure you of forgiveness. That's a wonderful extra, okay? To prayer. Your prayer life is, is important. Ever have a prayer vigil here at Grace Church? Do you ever just open up the church for a couple hours for um, prayer? People walk in and pray? Okay. There are plenty of crises, crises in the world. We could probably do that once a week and not be... Often enough, okay, or something like that. Or come early to church and have a little prayer vigil of your own. So this is the template for reform. Everyone was filled with all, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Now the ap apostolic age is over, and <clears throat> you probably won't see me make a lame person walk the way Peter and John did. And that's, but there still are miracles. The Holy Spirit will still perform miracles amongst us. Hmm? because we are his people. What's the miracle? What kind of miracle would knock your socks off? Full church? Yeah, that'd be good. He can do that. He can do that. I, I didn't mean that as a put down, but it's like double services, so many people. He can do that. Okay, so look for those. All the believers were together, <clears throat> together frequently. Now you have your own homes, but during the week you, you seek each other out. You seek each other out. Find excuses to get together. I noticed uh, in the bulletin, next Sunday there's a chili soup dinner. Don't miss it. Now you can eat chili at home, but that's not the point. You're together with one another, okay? And you share everything in common. They even sold their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. <clears throat> I think that's the brotherhood. Okay, maybe they gave to the guy on the street, you know, the homeless guy. My hunch is you have your share here. There are plenty of them in Phoenix. and so That's good. But if there's a need in the congregation, you meet it. You meet it because you were family, okay? Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, had each other over for dinner. And they with glad and sincere hearts. And I think all this joy is because of Jesus. Jesus had died, but Jesus had, had risen again. So <clears throat> reform is the rage. It's in the world of politics, government, civic-mindedness. It's, it's everywhere. Why not here? Why not now? Not October 31st, 1517, but October 25th, twenty. 50, and this is the template. And you know, in a word, I think it's about intimacy. It's about Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus and intimacy with one another. Be, let's be close. I, it's easy to say, let's be close. But let's strive to carry one another's burdens, share your own burdens, 
Hmm? Okay, build each other up. Tell your secrets. <gasps> tell your secret. Really, tell your secrets. Intimacy. My hunch is you'll be, f you know, if it's a naughty secret, your brother or sister in Christ will, won't go to the newspaper and say, have I got a news lead for you? No, they'll forgive you. They'll forgive you. And this intimacy will have its benefit. People will notice that. You've seen those Lutherans over there on 8th Street? They're so close and loving. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting.